I wouldn't have chose to be anywhere else. I take my job seriously. The college is important to me. I knew what I was risking, and I knew standing on that sports field in the middle of that firestorm that it, it, it was going to be a defining moment for all of us. I was sitting having dinner with my family when I got the phone call. Uh, it's probably a little after 6.30. Um, took me maybe five or ten minutes to leave the house, pack some things up. The person that called me, Pierre Ryu, works with me up at the college. And his first call was to 911. Thomas Aquinas College. Okay, you're reporting the fire, sir? Yes, ma'am. Okay, we're on the way, sir. We have multiple units en route, okay? Thank you, ma'am. We uh, There's about 400 students here. Okay, you're uh, you're calling from the college? Yes, ma'am. Okay, is the fire anywhere near you guys? Yeah, uh, it's pretty close, ma'am. Okay, if it's safe to do so, sir, have everyone exit the buildings that are near, okay? All right, we're, we're already, okay, we're taking precautions already, ma'am. Okay. Engine 20, Medic Engine 5, Engine 67, Medic Engine 2, Engine 64, Dozer 2, Safety, PIO, Utility 40, Battalion 10, Respond to fill an upgraded brush fire, 10,000, Santa Paula, Ojai Road, New Thomas Aquinas College, Thank you. Picture of Cap 20, this is going to be the area of Thomas Aquinas College, 10,000, Santa Paula, Ojai Road. Engine 20, this will be closer to Thomas Aquinas. I think he was the first credible call for the fire. Uh, he was the one that uh, gave the location. And he said it was south of Thomas Aquinas College. Uh, so for a short time, it was the Thomas Aquinas fire. But nobody could pronounce Aquinas. <laughs> so they shorted it to the Thomas uh, fire. So his, his next call was to me. And he said there was a fire uh, close to the college, just to the south and that it looked like it was going to be a bad one, especially I knew that the east winds were kicking up. So I headed up towards the college. I was very happy to see that a number of fire trucks had beaten me out of the blocks. Stuckel Park was already lined with fire trucks, and I saw a command car off to the side. So I stopped to try to talk to uh, one of the chiefs because we have, uh, we have close to, we can have close to 500 people on campus. Uh, so it's kind of a crowd up in that tight canyon, and uh, I wanted to get some direction from the fire department. The chief told me that there wasn't an, uh, was not an evacuation order at the time, but I asked him what he'd like us to do, and he'd said that uh, he would rather that we weren't there. So by the time I got to the college, uh, all the students had assembled in the commons building, along with uh, faculty and staff of the college, and the college president was there. College president's Mike McLean, so I walked up to Mike and told him what the chief had told me. I thought I was going to have to do a little convincing, <laughs> but I, I was really happy that he, he decided right then and there that we were going to evacuate the college. So it took uh, probably from that moment, it probably took about 45 minutes to get everybody off the campus, and we, we really did it just in time because by the time we started the vac, cars were actually leaving campus. The road to Santa Paula was already closed, so everybody had to evacuate through Ojai. And maybe 10 minutes after the last car left, the road to Ojai closed because uh, the fire had uh, had crossed there. So, you know, we could we could just tell that the fire was going to be huge. So what we had, but we had maybe after we got everybody off, we had probably five to six hours before the fire actually got to campus. So a skeleton crew uh, stayed, myself, I already mentioned Pierre Ryu, Ben Coughlin, and Andrew Carey all worked for me. They stayed, Father Machowski decided to stay, and our college president and his wife decided to stay also. Spent that time filling up fire trucks. We have two wells and a 350,000 gallon storage tank. 
<laughs> we filled a lot of fire trucks up that night. And actually, uh, for uh, the weeks after the fire also, there were trucks coming in and out of campus to fill up. Um, we got our own hoses out. Uh, we uh, locked down all the buildings, made sure all the windows, doors were closed. And then we uh, kind of just sat down and waited, snuck a meal maybe at a 11.30 or midnight, and about maybe 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, Ben, Andrew, and I decided to call, climb the bell tower at the chapel to try to get a sense of where the fire was going to hit us because we could see that it had pretty much surrounded us. And then once we climbed the bell tower and could get the lay of the land, we realized that the fire was coming from all sides at once. And that's exactly what it did. At about 2.30, uh, the college was hit from all sides. At that time, we evacuated uh, to the sports field on campus. And uh, Ben works for the grounds department. He's one of my ground supervisors. Fired up the sprinklers on the sports field to keep the fire at bay. It then started raining fire. And uh, the winds were uh, incredible. We almost got knocked over on the sports field. The winds were so high. The sports field actually caught on fire in some areas. We weren't alone there. The fire department had evacuated some of our neighbors to our sports field. So we had maybe, I don't know, in the neighborhood between probably 20 to 24 other people on campus and maybe a dozen vehicles. As that firestorm hit, a couple cars came in and they were accompanied by somebody on a motorcycle. This is right in the middle of when it's rain and fire and they decided not to stay. <laughs> I tried to convince them. I had heard later that they had gotten out through Ojai, uh, and the guy on the motorcycle made it. I'm sure it was the ride of his life. That time on the sports field, so that was maybe, we were on the sports field for, <sighs> may have been about four hours. Uh, and in that time, you know, we were putting out fires in proximity to us, and the fire would kind of, attack and retreat. Um, and that, that, during those times when the fire would retreat, we would uh, uh, kind of go forth and check on the buildings and uh, put out different spot fires. You know, I saw at least six fires on the roofs of the buildings. Um, we probably put out at least a half a dozen fires in proximity to the building. Um, uh, during the firestorm, we we lost track of Father Marchewski, so we'd gone to find him, get him back, bring him to the sports field. And uh, while we were doing that, we found a burning chair outside the back door of one of our dorms, and it was catching the back door on fire. Uh, so Andrew and I picked the chair up and threw it away, threw it away from the building and uh, extinguished the chair and uh, put out the fire on the back door. We spent the night, <laughs> that's how we spent the night. One of our neighbors was quite distressed, also an asthmatic with the smoke. Uh, so we were quite worried about her. I, I was afraid she was gonna try to bolt. <laughs> there was nowhere to go. <laughs> uh, so myself and uh, the fire chief who was on campus at the time, he would come by the sports field and, and uh, spend a little time with her and calm her down, and, and we would do the same. We had the forestry department on campus with maybe five or six trucks, and they were just wonderful. We hardly saw them at all from the sports field because we were removed from the buildings, but uh, the trucks would awful, often be driving by, uh, and we could see them uh, putting out different spot fires. The campus wouldn't be there if it wasn't for those, uh, those guys in the forestry department. It was just amazing. We would see different flare-ups throughout the night, huge flames. And we thought, I thought for sure, that there were buildings going off. The hillsides all around us were just engulfed in flames. There'd be waterfalls of flames coming off the mountainsides. And then those 80 mile an hour winds would kick up and it would turn that waterfall into a 100 foot 
plume of horizontal fire. It just sickeningly beautiful. Uh, it, it's, it's burnt into my mind. You know, I can close my eyes and see it. <laughs> it sometimes it would get quite hot because the fire was making its own uh, weather. Uh, when we got, when I would get overheated, I'd uh, cool off by running through the sprinklers, uh, kind of clean the smoke out of my eyes and out of my mouth. My beard throughout the night was kind of wet <laughs> and it's raining fire. And one of my memories is the sound of my beard going tss, 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 as the embers, <laughs> as the embers would land on it. Uh, Andrew and I saw, oh, I don't know, probably a hundred foot high plume of flame. And we had just completed our lecture hall. It was the newest building on campus. You know, I don't, on December 4th, I don't even think we'd had our first event in it yet. And we thought for sure that we were seeing it go off. And so we had to wait for the right moment on the sports field. And then we ran over there and realized that it wasn't, it wasn't uh, our lecture hall that we saw. It was uh, some of the redwood trees in our lower campus area. The main campus is, we call it the upper campus. But then down towards the creek, we call it the down below. Uh, the president's uh, residence is down there. It's a 10,000 square foot. It was called a summer home, but it was, uh, Doheny, it was built by Doheny. <laughs> but it's a 10,000 square foot uh, Mediterranean style mansion. And there's a heavily wooded area beyond it. And somebody in the past had planted maybe 100 redwood trees down there. And what we were seeing is a couple of those redwood trees going off. We could take a look down the hillside at the down below. We never went down there. Uh, after the fire hit the campus. Uh, luckily, Ben told me later that he ran down there maybe 10 o'clock and turned the sprinklers on around the hacienda. And that's, that's the only reason that building was saved. I spoke with the fire chief in the morning and he said uh, uh, that it was too dangerous. They, they didn't go down there. The flames were just so intense. Uh, so if it wasn't for Ben turning the sprinklers on, we would have lost that. The fire kind of burned a lot of those trees in a strange way. Uh, it, it, it came in low and hot and burned into the trunks of, I don't know how many of our trees, 100, 200 trees, I have no idea, and would burn out the core of the tree. And if there was a broken branch or something 20, 30 feet off the ground, there would be a blowtorch of flame, three, five foot, just screaming out of the side of the tree. The fire was so hot, it would, uh, it would get into the root system of the tree and burn out the roots completely. Uh, so we had three, maybe 80 foot high redwoods that after the fire were just 80 foot poles stuck in the ground. Uh, you could see that the underneath their root structure was completely gone. Uh, in a windstorm, maybe two or three weeks after the fire, one of those fell across one of our roads. Uh, so we decided to take, go ahead and take the other two down. A shocking thing to me was I'd seen other trees on fire. And after the fire, there was always some remnant of the tree. There'd be a burnt stump, a branch, there'd be something. So many of these trees are just completely gone. And all you see is uh, an ash trail where the branches were on the ground. And uh, even the roots are burnt out. So if you can find the holes in the ground where the tree was, uh, you'll see a, a number of little tunnels going down where the, where the uh, flame got in and burnt the whole root structure out of the tree. We make it to the next day. So it's maybe 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning. And things seem to be calming down a little bit. Uh, so we all hopped into our vehicles that we had on the uh, sports field and snuck a 10 or 15 minute nap. Uh, the sun came up and I, I was wondering how much of the campus we had lost. Uh, I, I was really wondering if I still had a job. <laughs> if if there's gonna be enough campus to put back together. Um, I was busy on the sports field dealing with all of our neighbors, uh, um, but uh, 
it's, it was safe enough to send Ben out, Ben and Andrew out for a quick drive around the campus. And I told them I want to know what buildings we lost. And I was absolutely shocked when they came back and told us that we hadn't lost any. You know, on one of our trips out, there were fires right next to the buildings, right next to them, and fires on top of the buildings. It was just shocking to me that the Forest Service was able to put those out. So pleasantly surprised to see the campus still standing. Uh, we, on one of our trips out, uh, we found a, uh, a fire just starting next to, uh, used to be called the Graves House, but uh, now we call it Loyola Hall. It's uh, one of our priests lives there. And it's a wood structure, wood siding, uh, with a wood shop next to it, all built of wood. And the brush around it is being engulfed, but it's small. And uh, Ben and I tried to get it out. Uh, I guess it was the only time during the fire that I, I was frightened. Because <laughs> while we were trying to stomp the fire out, we didn't have any implements. All we had was our boots. We were making headway, and a gust kicked up, and suddenly we were engulfed in flames. And uh, I was blinded by the smoke, and uh, uh, just hoping that I was moving in the right direction. <laughs> and it wasn't far. You know, I just needed to move five or 10 feet and I was fine, but it was still kind of shocking. Uh, I knew, <laughs> I knew more than most people what I was risking uh, uh, when I was uh, six years old, I was playing with fire. I ca I'd caught myself on fire, so I've, I've, uh, uh, I'm uh, pretty scarred up underneath my shirt from third degree burns. Uh, and so I, I, I knew what the fire meant. Uh, the guys who were staying with me didn't. Before the road closed, I told them nobody has to stay. Uh, risking your life isn't part of your job description. Uh, uh, if, you're, if you wanted to stay, we're gonna pay you, but <laughs> you're, you're not here as an employee though. You're, you're here to save the college. And, and they really rose to the occasion, I mean, to have a group of guys that I've stood against a fire, stood in a fire with, it's, uh, it's just amazing. The fire happened the week before the kids were supposed to have finals. When the fire started moving away, we were really hopeful that we could bring them back and have them do their finals before they all went home for Christmas vacation. Because Christmas vacation is weeks and I went to the college. I graduated from the college in 1985. So, familiar with the college. I was stuck on campus for probably, it was probably five days before I got home. And we were cut off. The power went down, the, uh, the roads were out. Uh, with the power, the landlines went out, the cell towers burnt. So we were cut off from the world. I knew the fire was headed towards Ventura, and I, I knew the winds were fierce, but it was quite a while, it was maybe a full day before we were talking to one of the firefighters, and he, and he clued us in what was, what was happening in Ventura. And we'll give you an idea as we pan to the right, just how many homes were lost. There's hundreds of homes up in this canyon, all north of Foothill. The fire just moved through here too quickly with too much uh, in the way of high winds to save most of these homes. But we really feel for these folks, there are once again hundreds of homes right in this area that were just completely- I got word that my own family uh, evacuated. Uh, I was happy that they took my dog with them. <laughs> I live next door to my parents. My parents evacuated to my sister's house in Ojai. Uh, and then later in the evening, they were evacuated from there. Uh, they went to a hotel. And then a couple days later, they were able to come home. My fa family was also able to come home. Uh, the fire started to come back. Uh, so they had to evacuate again. My father didn't want to leave, uh, so uh, 
one of my older sons, Henry, stayed with them. Um, and later in the evening, uh, he realized uh, that it was too close. They had to go again. And my dad, uh, uh, my dad was 88, and it was quite stressful for him. So he didn't want to leave, and I think he kind of went into shock and started having to fight my son. And he was just out of his mind. Ambulance came. Henry had to help him strap him to the gurney. Uh, one of the last things he said before they took him to the hospital uh, was uh, Henry and my, grand my dad had an interesting relationship that involved a lot of banter. And uh, my, uh, my dad called Henry the grandpa killer. <laughs> But my dad was just uh, really just out of his mind with all the stress. And he himself had quite a life. You know, he, had, he was a fighter pilot. He flew 100 missions in Vietnam. And, and I think the PTSD was coming back for him that night. Just an interesting aside, the winds were so fierce that night also as they were taking my father to the hospital in the ambulance, it was blown up onto two wheel, wheels. And my mom, who was following the ambulance in her car, thought for sure the ambulance was going to roll over. But the driver was able to get it back down. And after they got my father to the hospital, the attendant told my son that after that happened, my dad was fine. <laughs> it, uh, it knocked him out of it. I'm a little glassy-eyed talking about it because he since died, not because of the fire. I'm sure the stress didn't help. Uh, but uh, I can't even, <laughs> like you said, pre or post fire. <laughs> For me, the fire was two weeks ago. You know, it's just so uh, the passage of time. I wouldn't have chose to be anywhere else. I take my job seriously. The college is important to me. And like I said, I knew what I was risking. And I knew standing on that sports field in the middle of that firestorm that it, it, it was going to be a defining moment for all of us.